Welcome everyone to the February uh, presentation in uh, the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health monthly lecture series. And uh, we're in for a good one today. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. I'm gonna introduce Ryan Vandry, today's speaker. Um, Ryan is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where he has the Cannabis Science Laboratory that's part of the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit there, uh, which is an internationally longstanding great unit. So uh, we're really thrilled to have Ryan with us today. Um, Ryan received, before going to Johns Hopkins, Ryan was actually part of the University of Vermont. So that's why I'm especially proud of him and, and happy he's with us today. Um, where he uh, took his PhD in experimental psychology under the mentorship of, of Alan Budney. Um, he, he got his degree in 2005, and from there went on to a postdoctoral fellowship um, at the BPRU uh, at Johns Hopkins in uh, 2005 through 2007, and then just stayed on the faculty there and worked his way up um, to the point where in 2020, he um, became a full professor at Johns Hopkins, which I could tell you is not easy to accomplish. So it really uh, tells you a lot about, about Ryan's um, accomplishments. And uh, Ryan is a national and international expert in uh, cannabis and um, he is going to speak us, to us today on a very timely topic, which is uh, edibles. And this, this whole field, as you know, has just exploded with the legalization of cannabis. But uh, Ryan and I were chatting, and I'll just be quick about it, about this. When did cannabis research start here at, at the University of Vermont? And I was recalling Alan Budney as a postdoctoral fellow doing a... Um, a small end study, two participants um, who were cocaine dependent and also using um, uh, marijuana. And the experimental question was, we got their cocaine use under control, um, ignoring the marijuana using contingency management, could we get the marijuana under control as, as well? And it worked and got published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. And then who knew at that time that Ryan would be soon joining, um, Al, well, not soon, <laughs> about 15 years later, but joining Alan, um, not to, to probably 10 years later, Alan in the um, research that was going on here in cannabis. And, and each of them would become internationally known um, investigators in cannabis. It, it, it was not a hot area at that time, but they, through their work and the work of many others, it certainly is now. So Ryan, I, don't, I wanna make sure that you have plenty of time uh, for your presentation. Um, I thank you for, for being with us today. I know you're awfully busy. So one, one more uh, little housekeeping things. Um, we're gonna ask you to please send your uh, questions through the Q&A button rather than the chat button. And Ryan will answer questions when he is uh, through his lecture. So Ryan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Steve. I really appreciate it. And it's an all, always an honor to come back and speak to folks at UVM and I love the opportunity. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and go through my slides here as my requisite disclosures. I'm gonna uh, show you guys some studies funded by a number of federal agencies and I'll also receive money for consulting and scientific advisory board work for several institutes. Um, so, He's jumped a whole bunch of things there. All right, so just to start with, I'm gonna kind of get us all on the same page on what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna drill down on cannabis edibles, so oral formulations of cannabis. And it's an emerging and increasing market, um, multiple billion dollar a year industry in the US. And if you break out and look at hemp, oral hemp products or CBD products, it's even more. I think that's about $5 billion a year. Um, uh, smoked cannabis is still the most uh, popular route of administration, um, but edibles is second to, to smoked. And 
when you break down individual users, you tend to see a higher rate of, of uh, edible um, administration among medicinal cannabis users versus recreational folks. Um, and it's important to drill down and look at edibles distinctly and separately from inhaled forms of cannabis because there's a different time course of effects versus the other routes of administration. And there's a whole lot of product formulation issues that, that bring to bear on the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. And so just to kind of highlight some kind of cross-study comparisons of work that we've done in, in the laboratory here at Hopkins, uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see um, blood THC levels. And on the right-hand panel, you'll look at subjective drug effect levels. Um, when the same batch of cannabis is administered through different routes of administration at the same dose. So this is all data from a 25 milligram THC dose when people smoke it, vape it, or eat it. And oral dosing in this uh, particular study was in a brownie. And so you can see that on the left-hand side here, compared with inhaled um, cannabis, you get much lower peak THC levels and they're more stable for a longer period of time. But despite the much lower blood THC levels, the subjective drug effects are very comparable. So equating pharmacokinetics and blood levels to pharmacodynamic effects becomes very different. But we see on par um, drug effects between oral dosing and smoked cannabis. Um, and a lot of that can be a little bit misinformed when you look at um, kind of popular and even scientific data where people will say, well, the bioavailability of oral THC is so much lower. It is lower systemically in, in terms of available uh, THC in blood, but it doesn't necessarily translate to um, big differences in pharmacodynamic effects or drug effects. Uh, and that relates to the, lip, uh, the lipophilic nature of THC. It sticks to tissue um, and kind of persists a little bit longer. Um, so just to kind of come back to the prevalence of edibles and, and market share, this graph shows you actual and projected data in terms of the uh, amount, the, the market share of edibles in the US. And you can see, again, billions of dollars in sales uh, just in the US and it's, it's comparable in Canada and other places that have legalized cannabis now. Um, so what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time to drill down on what makes edibles special and what factors are important in understanding and interpreting the differences in different types of edibles. You've got some pictures at the bottoms. You see um, edibles in, in candies, in baked goods, in chocolates. You'll see drinks, a bunch of other things. I want to talk a little bit about um, manufacturing methods, differences in formulations, chemical compositions, and differences in dose and concentration of these products because it's not very uniform. And as I hope you'll see, the differences in each of those becomes important in terms of the out, uh, resulting effects of the drug. So on the manufacturing end of things, there are a number of um, ways in which cannabis producers make their products. Um, so one is the source material. So you can use the raw dried botanical material you can use extracts that can be extracted a number of different ways, uh, CO2 extraction, uh, ethanol extraction, or uh, um, uh, like a benzene type extraction. There's a number of different ways of extracting the material, um, and, and that can impact the resulting final formulation or the final product. Um, and then People will, uh, companies will, will sometimes use the whole plant extract in these products. And in other cases, they'll tease out and they'll selectively extract certain cannabinoids from terpenes and other parts of the plant product and reconstitute them in non-natural ratios in the final product. Um, so there's an intense variety based on just the source material. Um, with edibles, because you're not necessarily dealing with the raw botanical product, the concentration of the drug in the final matrix is not always uniformly distributed. Um, so for example, if you extract things and you don't homogenize the drug through the product and you have a large chocolate, 
you know, one end of the chocolate might have twice the drug as the other end of the chocolate. Depends on how well the, the manufacturer is, is homogenizing and, and ensuring quality control and consistency within the, within the, the drug. Um, the other thing with edibles um, that a lot of people don't know is that in the natural botanical form, it, THC and CBD are in their acid forms in the plant. And in order to be active and to be absorbed and to get into the CNS and, and produce pharmaco pharmacologic effects, there's a need to decarboxylate the acid forms into the, the neutral forms. And usually that's done with heat. So when you take a dried cannabis flower and you smoke it or vaporize it, the heat as part of that uh, drug administration process decarboxylates the acid of THC and turns it into a THCA, it turns it into THC. Um, so that process has to happen for an edible to have full effects. And so typically you need to heat the, the plant material or the extract in some way to form that decarboxylation. And in some cases we've shown in, in product evaluations that it's not everybody does that or does it well. Um, so if you end up with a product that still has acid forms of the cannabinoids, it's not gonna be near as potent as someone that did. Um, we're worried about contaminants. Uh, so in any botanical product, there's risk for pesticides. If solvents were used with the extraction process, residual solvents can be found in these products. Um, heavy metals, bacteria, and in some cases, people have found other drugs in these products. So uh, in a, what's largely an unregulated uh, market, we need to be worried about all of these things and even where it is regulated at the state level. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the contaminants could come from the source cannabis or from other food products. Um, and so this highlights, you know, in an era where federally um, these products are not regulated, it, it's important to look at the quality of the regulation at the state level and to be very wary of anything purchased over the internet or from the black market. Um, so to highlight some of those issues, we conducted a couple surveillance uh, testing studies, one of CBD oils purchased over the internet and another of edible products purchased from uh, dispensaries in California and Washington state um, before those markets were, were more tightly regulated or as regulated as they are now. Uh, and what I'll show you in these CBD oils here, we tested 84 different products and we found intense variability in the chemical composition of these products. So these were all sold as CBD oils. And when you look at the, the content of CBD in these products, it ranged from less than one milligram to 655 milligrams per milliliter of solution. Uh, label wise, you couldn't really tell that much difference between these products. Um, you could see that some of the products still had CBDA in them, so it hadn't been fully decarboxylated. And THC ranged from zero to six and a half milligrams per milliliter. And six and a half milligrams is a decent dose of THC. Um, so again, in none of these products listed THC as an ingredient. So we need to be a little bit mindful of what's in these things, how accurate is the label. Uh, when we looked at um, the uh, edible products purchased, again, this is California and Washington before adult legal uh, uh, legalization. Um, we found again an, an immense range from less than one to over one gram of THC in a single product. Um, again, a decent amount of THC acid in the products, so not full decarboxylation here. And then a small amount of a number of other minor cannabinoids. So cannabigerol or CBG, cannabinol, CBN. And we start to see more and more of those kinds of minor cannabinoid products popping up on the market where they're the predominant chemical constituent. What people often forget with the pull, full legalization of, of, of cannabis is that there is a, a regulated pharmaceutical market for cannabinoids. So uh, dronabinol was approved by the FDA back in 1986. Um, and in 1992, nabilone was approved. Nabilone is a, a THC analog. So dronabinol is synthetic THC suspended in sesame oil in these little gel caps. 
And then just a few years ago, uh, an oral solution in which CBD is the primary chemical constituent was approved by the FDA to treat rare seizure disorders. So while most of the, the market push and a lot of the, the media attention is on you know, the, these state legal and, and sometimes quasi legal cannabis and hemp markets, uh, a lot of people lose sight of the fact that there are FDA um, approved and, and carefully controlled and regulated cannabinoid products available as prescription medicines. So um, with kind of that background, I want to talk a little bit about these differences in formulation. So cannabis edibles come in a lot of different flavors, a lot of different form factors. Um, we see baked goods, we see candies, oils, tinctures, capsules, pills, and drinks are a big emerging market in this area. Um, what we know is that a number of things can impact absorption and pharmacokinetics uh, with all of these products. Um, the one thing that's em emerged in a number of studies is that fat content and other macronutrients can affect drug absorption and, and bioavailability. And in contrast to a number of other medications and drugs, uh, consuming cannabis products with a high fat meal uh, or dense macronutrients actually facilitates and enhances the absorption of, of THC and CBD. Um, so it's the opposite of what you would think of with a lot, most um, pharmaceutical drugs as well as alcohol. We actually did a survey study recently where we asked people about the impact of diet on, on cannabis drug effects. And it was about a 50-50 split. About half the people correctly knew that if you ate with your drug, you'd get better absorption and a stronger drug effect. And about half thought the opposite was true. Um, so there's a need for education about this. Um, another thing when you look at the, um, the cannabis industry is you see a lot of people talking about the application of nanotechnology. Um, so uh, trying to manipulate the molecules in a way to improve solubility. So you can't just add THC to a beverage and have it work. It ends up sitting in the water like oil and sticking to the sides of the can or the bottle or whatever it's in. Um, so a lot of companies are now coming up with nano emulsions of, of THC and CBD and beverages that they claim will speed up the absorption and facilitate absorption. So you get uh, earlier onset and stronger drug effects. Um, but there hasn't really been any research to demonstrate that these are in, in, indeed effective uh, for that purpose. So uh, I think a couple of studies are ongoing at the moment. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not any of that emerges and actually works. Um, and then when you look at the product types, you can have different types of, uh, of, of absorption based on the just the matrix. So if you think about these lollipops that you have down there, and you're sucking on, on the, the drug and the, and the candies and it's kind of in your mouth, you could get buccal absorption versus GI absorption, which is subject to a lot of first pass metabolism. And again, this is an area where we'd like to do some more research and do some more studies to look at this, but it hasn't been characterized it yet. And if you go into a store, all of these things are available and the state regulations about unit doses per product apply across the board to all of these uh, cookies and lollipops and chocolates, but there might be a lot of variability in drug absorption and resulting drug effects based on the food matrix that's being used. So an example of a research study in our lab, we took um, 100 milligrams of CBD synthetically derived and we put it either in a gel cap uh, we used uh, Epidiolex, which is that pharmaceutical CBD in uh, sesame oil, uh, or we put the CBD in a liquid uh, pharmaceutical grade cherry syrup. Um, and we had people take it acutely one time and we looked at uh, CBD concentration in whole blood across these different formulations in six individuals. And we saw quite a bit of variance um, in the rate of absorption across these three formulations where epidiolex the, uh, in that oil matrix um, had much higher uh, 
blood concentrations compared with the oral capsule, uh, which was intermediate and very low blood concentrations in that cherry syrup. The, the drug did not dissolve well in the syrup. And we had a, an extra condition where we had people come in after fasting overnight and taking that same uh, cherry syrup and we saw very, very little drug absorption. So again, these three conditions, people were given a low fat breakfast along with their dose. So a little bit of food helps absorption compared with the fasting, but then an oil matrix versus a gel cap versus a, a liquid solution um, had very different levels of, of drug absorption. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really important, um, and one of the things that I'm really harping on more and more now is, is the importance of chemical composition. Um, if we just simply refer to things as cannabis right now, we don't know what people are talking about um, because cannabis could mean a CBD dominant product or a THC dominant product. And those have very different impacts. They're different levels of risk, different likely outcomes in terms of drug effects. So I think it's important that we specify when we're talking about cannabis, what kind of cannabis product are we talking about? Are we talking about THC dominant, CBD dominant, or other minor cannabinoids? And I've got a number of examples down here of the different kinds of products. So we see Delta-8 THC products. Uh, there's, there's no new research in the laboratory on Delta-8, but you go back and look at Leo Hollister did some beautiful studies in the, in the 1970s and early 80s with Delta-8 THC and showed that it's a, depending on the outcome, it's about 40 to 80% as potent as Delta-9 THC. And these Delta-8 things are legal and you can find them at gas stations and, and head shops and, get, and, and other places across the U.S. now due to a loophole in the farm bill. You've got CBD products, uh, you've got uh, THC products, you've got CBG products and THCV products, and these all have, you know, different main cannabinoid contents. They're going to have very different pharmacodynamic uh, outcomes. But we don't know a lot about CBG or THCV, yet these things are widely available um, uh, in the marketplace right now. Then there's other non-cannabinoid constituents. I mentioned before that people, some of the manufacturers are selectively pulling out terpenes and reconstituting them and putting them in and in different levels in these products. You see some products with added sugars, uh, like little THC energy shot type deals. Um, you see caffeine, vitamins, like vi B vitamins in particular are common in these things. And a lot of what's in there can drive very different pharmacodynamic effects across different products. So we really need a lot of research on, on what all of these different product types um, result with. Um, and then dose is super important as well, of course, right? But as I showed you before, the labeled dose on a product is not necessarily the actual dose. And the further away you get from tight regulation, the less likely you are to see accuracy in the dose labeling. Uh, we've seen examples of, of products with a certificate of analysis on the company website that is three years old and they're still applying it to the same product, assuming all of their batches are made exactly the same. So it's important to check that, but also to try to think carefully about it. So here's an example of a chocolate bar. It says that this thing's got 60 milligrams of THC. Well, all 60 milligrams could be in this one end and there could be nothing over there. It's nice and kind of separated here where you might think that if it's homogenized, you get 15 milligrams per square. Um, but we don't know if that's actually the case. And you get this little diagonal thing, maybe if you want to get seven and a half milligrams. You got to be careful with all of that stuff. Um, in medicinal applications of cannabis, the dose needs to be tailored for the indication of interest. And a lot of times you don't need a, a dose that causes you a drug effect or makes you feel high to be effective for certain therapies. Um, there's a lot of... Um, medical doctors who promote the medical use of cannabis argue that you don't necessarily need to get high to get therapeutic benefit from cannabis products. And the adage here is that if you start low and go slow, slowly incrementing or building up the dose, 
until you see the therapeutic effect, not till you feel a subjective drug effect. And, and that's where you stop. And so ideally, if you're in a scenario where you're using cannabis for medical purposes, you want to find a dose where you get therapeutic effects, but you don't get adverse effects and you don't feel high. Um, so where is that dose? I want to talk through a couple studies that we've done uh, in my lab looking at, at, uh, at drug effects at different doses. Um, so in a lot of state regulated uh, cannabis markets, 10 milligrams is kind of the max unit dose. Um, but before those regulations came out, if you look back at that slide I showed you that we uh, studied uh, cannabis edibles in, in California and Washington, 50 milligrams was the median dose in the products that we tested. So we did a study a few years ago where we looked at 10 milligrams, 25 milligrams, and 50 milligrams of THC in a brownie. And we see nice dose orderly effects, but you, you can see when you get up to 25 and 50 milligrams, we're almost hitting a ceiling on the magnitude of drug effect. 10 milligrams is a nice intermediate dose, but gets people a little high. Doesn't really make people uncomfortable, but boy, that 50 milligrams started getting people up there where they started feeling pretty anxious and nauseous and sick. Um, 25 and 50 milligrams is also where we started to see impairment on a number of measures of, of cognitive functioning. So divided attention, um, working memory, and, and basic psychomotor task ability. So again, not much difference between 25 and 50 milligrams. The difference is there we're really in the, in the rate of adverse events. And I think we, you know, as THC is a partial agonist, we almost maxed out the impairment and, and the, the magnitude of subjective drug effects that we had at, that, at those two doses. So what that highlights is that there's a really narrow therapeutic window with THC. You start to feel a drug effect at 10 milligrams, at 25 milligrams, you're kind of getting really high. I want to point out that these are folks who were not frequent cannabis users, so non-tolerant None of these folks had used cannabis for at least a month. In fact, on average, their last exposure was a year before being in the study. So <clears throat> new to cannabis, somewhat novice users, the difference between 10 and 25 milligrams is that you're feeling almost double, if not more, the drug effect, and you're getting pretty strong sense of impairment of cognitive functioning. Um, when we flip back and we talk about those differences in, in chemical constituents, CBD, on the other hand, is not THC-like in our hands. And we've administered 100 milligrams of CBD uh, through oral and vaporized uh, dosing patterns. And then when we give 100 milligrams of CBD with a little bit of THC through vaporization, that's where we start to see a little bit of THC-like effects. So feeling your heart pounding, getting a dry mouth, a little bit of trouble with memory, but that's a small dose of THC. But there's no signal of any of that stuff with CBD by itself, especially through the oral route of administration. In fact, in this study, when we gave 100 milligrams of CBD orally, we didn't have a, any differences on any subjective drug effect measures compared with placebo. Um, one of the newer studies that we're doing right now, however, is on CBD, THC, and, and other drug interactions. And this is really fascinating new data where we're seeing that although CBD by itself doesn't have much of a, an interoceptive drug effect and doesn't really cause impairment or anything like that. CBD in combination with THC at a fairly high dose of CBD, this, in this study, uh, we gave 20 milligrams of THC alone and 20 milligrams of THC with 640 milligrams of CBD. And we saw a big impact of the CBD on THC metabolism which resulted in stronger and longer lasting drug effects. In fact, we began this study at a 40 milligram THC dose and we completely knocked out our first two participants. Um, so what you can see here is that compared with placebo, you get a decent drug effect with 20 milligrams of THC. But when we add the CBD, we get a big increase in the magnitude and the duration of the of, of subjective drug effects. This goes across all other pharmacodynamic um, outcomes, and the mechanism is, in fact, a pharmacokinetic drug interaction. And so we see that the combinations of adding the CBD is 
increasing plasma THC concentrations and also drastically increasing the 11-hydroxy THC metabolite. 11-hydroxy THC is a, 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 an active metabolite that's believed to be equipotent to THC and possibly acts as a full agonist versus a partial agonist. So we believe that this is really driving that increase in, in subjective drug effects and also the, a number of adverse effects that we see at an identical THC dose. Um, so what I described to you up till now has been lab studies really focused on, on acute single dosing and people that don't really use cannabis. Um, but we were interested in how some of that stuff would translate to chronic dosing, because when you look at um, how people take it, it's not once a year, most, most often. Um, so a number of people will take cannabis multiple times per, uh, per day or at least daily, um, especially people using for therapeutic purposes. Um, there's a mix of THC dominant and CBD dominant products. Um, when you're looking at, at medical use, there's a huge market for daily use of CBD oils. Um, but as I mentioned before, a number of those contain small concentrations of THC. Um, and one of our ongoing studies is to look at the impact of taking CBD oils that contain a little bit of THC and how does that impact drug testing? How does that impact subjective drug effects and adverse events? Um, so in our ongoing study, we've got, a, I think, eight people through it now. Um, every people, every participant that's been taking this oil, we have them come in and we do a single acute dosing session, and then we have them take it twice a day for two weeks. Um, at every person that's been given uh, CBD oil with THC between 2.8 and 3.7 milligrams, have had a positive urine test within the first six hours of the first dose, um, and have tested positive repeatedly throughout. And so this highlights that you have a legal product that people can buy anywhere. And a lot of times you don't really know or you're not aware that, that a risk for a positive drug test could happen with these types of products. And to highlight this 2.8 uh, milligram THC dose here would be under the federal threshold for a 100 milligram CBD dose of 0.3%. So it meets the definition of hemp federally, so it would be unregulated by DEA, but can still cause positive uh, drug tests. And, and we do see some mild to moderate subjective drug effects at these doses of THC as well. We also, in chronic dosing studies and observational studies, see evidence of health improvement for the use of cannabis for a number of different health conditions. So we do some observational studies. We've looked at um, the people using um, artisanal CBD oils uh, to treat epilepsy. And while we didn't see a really strong indication uh, in differences in seizures, uh, in this population, most of the people were taking other anti-seizure medications. What we did see that was striking is a huge decrease in the adverse events related to medications in the people who were taking uh, CBD in addition to other um, uh, anti-epileptic uh, medications. And this was pretty much across the board. And so I think that the, the role of CBD in, in treating epilepsy, and I've talked to some physicians who, who work in this population, um, may, be, be, may go beyond seizure control. Another area that, that we noted in, in kind of a broad general uh, observational study of, of CBD users and, and medical cannabis users is a reduction in anxiety and depression. Uh, and this was really striking to us, in fact, you know, you see a lot of lab studies showing that the cannabinoids and CBD in particular can reduce anxiety. Um, hadn't seen much in the literature on depression, and we're seeing it um, kind of a, uh, equally effective here. Um, so in this design, we take people who are kind of new to cannabis, and we measure their anxiety and their depression before they initiate the use of cannabis, and then get them again after they initiate the use of cannabis. And we're seeing pretty marked reductions in anxiety and depression um, in the people that newly initiate cannabis use versus people that do not initiate. So we've got a, a comparison control group of people that were never 
medical cannabis users and people who are medical cannabis users to begin with and maintained their um, cannabis use and they even continue to improve a little bit over time. Um, <clears throat> Kelly Dunn, who's another UVM alum, uh, ran a laboratory study here looking at the synergy between THC and opioids for pain. You look at preclinical data, uh, it suggests that you can combine subtherapeutic doses of an opioid and a THC or another uh, CB1 agonist and get um, synergistic analgesia. Um, in the human laboratory, though, we don't really see near as, uh, the strength of, of what we see in, uh, in preclinical models. What she saw was a really modest increase in, in uh, thermal pain threshold. So this is a, a laboratory model of analgesia. And it was really specific to a lower dose of THC. This is a subtherapeutic dose of hydromorphone by itself. But what we did see is that even though you had a little bit of, of, of uh, additive um, analgesic effects on some models of, of uh, uh, QST uh, analysis, it was at the cost of a drastic increase in impairment, drug effects, and abuse liability that when the, the um, opioid and the cannabinoid were combined, people did not tolerate the, that combination very well. Um, but in contrast to that, another study uh, run by Erica Peters, another UVM alum that I have the good fortune to continue to work with, um, a lot of the, these treatment of emergent adverse events that we see in our single acute dosing studies, and when you do a chronic dosing study, um, this, is, this is two and a half to 10 milligrams of THC twice a day, people quickly develop tolerance to the adverse effects of the medication. So this was a, a 14 day study. Most of the adverse events that people experienced were just getting used to it on the first day and they drastically declined. And, and by the end of two weeks, people were not really reporting any problems or issues tolerating the medication. So we have to keep that kind of stuff in mind and keep in mind acute versus chronic dosing models when we're doing laboratory studies and, and trying to extrapolate and generalize to, to therapeutic or medical uh, purpose use utilization. Um, detecting drug impairment has become an, a, a really key thing for regulators and policymakers um, because, and, and this is in, it particularly important in the case of edibles because the pharmacokinetics are so different from inhaled cannabis. Um, so objectively detecting impairment at the roadside or on the workplace is much different. So I showed you a little bit of data earlier on plasma levels being different um, and, and how do you do that, right? So here's uh, some data from another study that we did where we, we had people um, uh, oral, orally administer and vaporize cannabis at different doses. Uh, this shows you subjective drug effects at placebo, 10 milligrams of THC and 25 milligrams of THC. And we get nice dose orderly uh, drug effects. We get impairment of cognitive uh, performance here. Um, so we know that these guys are feeling high, they're impaired, you know, but when we then go and uh, look at, well, can we look at blood levels of THC and is that going to, is that going to show us if somebody's impaired while they're operating a vehicle or driving a forklift or get into an accident at work? And it's really challenging to do that. So when you look at blood THC levels, after 25 milligrams of oral THC, it's less than three nanograms per milliliter. When they vaporize it, it's 40. Um, we did some other studies where people who are daily routine cannabis users and they haven't used cannabis for 24 hours, some of them are still far above this. So you could have someone be responsible and use cannabis every night before they go to bed or after dinner to relax or whatnot. The next morning they get up and they're no longer intoxicated. They drive to work, get into an accident. Their blood THC level could be higher than somebody that just took 25 milligrams of THC and they're severely impaired. So blood THC is not a good proxy for impairment acutely. We actually have seen uh, THC levels in blood this high for people passively exposed to, um, to cannabis smoke in a, in a small enclosed environment. 
And then, so a lot of people will say, well, what about oral fluid saliva testing? So we did that in this study as well. And you can see big high concentrations of, of THC and saliva shortly after they uh, eat the brownie, but it's completely gone in two hours. And that's kind of when peak drug effects are happening. So oral fluid is not a good matrix either. Um, so what about field sobriety testing? So in this study, we had uh, a drug recognition officer from the Maryland State Police come out and train us how to do field sobriety testing, the same thing that you would do if you get pulled over at night, coming home from the bar. And with oral dosing, we see, you know, walk and turn, one-legged stand, Romberg is when you kind of close your eyes and have to touch your nose. Um, really not much difference between placebo and the 25 milligram dose and performance on this. You see it a little bit better on the walk and turn, but there's still um, half of the people would have passed this sobriety test on the roadside with no clues that they were impaired. So these field, traditional field sobriety tests tend not to be very sensitive to acute cannabis uh, dosing effects. So we've been working with a guy based in Boston who's developed an app that kind of integrates a number of different aspects of cannabis impairment that we see in the, in the laboratory, divided attention, balance, um, critical decision-making, but it's in a way that's really short and simple. And his app in this study showed really nice dose orderly effects. And, and it showed there, there was a pretty good clustering and sensitivity activity of drug effects here. So pre-dosing, everybody should really stable baselines. And we saw a little bit of impairment after the 10 milligram dose, which is consistent with what we see on other things. And we saw pretty consistent impairment at the 25 milligram dose across other participants. This dotted line here was individuals using the same app after drinking alcohol to a 0.08 level of, of, um, of, of breath alcohol concentration. So it shows that, you know, we're able to show some sensitivity. So it may be that behavioral testing may be the best way of, of determining impairment with cannabis since biomarkers are not really readily available. So just a couple other odds and ends to go through here. Um, it's important to note that what we found pretty consistently is that females and older adults tend to report stronger drug effects following oral, oral cannabis dosing compared with uh, males and, and younger adults. Um, in the study where I showed you the THC-CBD interaction, we're also seeing pretty significant drug-drug interactions between CBD and four different CYP450 uh, enzymes. So that has um, a number of important consequences for people taking other medications. Um, there, again, I mentioned the impact of gastric contracts on drug absorption. Um, and, and again, the safety of THC is often overstated. We have to be very careful of people who, with a family history of psychosis, and I should add here, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we're seeing more and more case reports of individuals, um, relatively healthy, younger adults experiencing cardiovascular events after acute dosing with, with THC. Um, <clears throat> So why, why are people using edibles so much? You get this longer time course of effects and, and that may be desirable in a number of circumstances, especially with therapeutic use. If you're looking to maintain a stable level of medication, oral dosing is much better than having to inhale 20 times a day. Um, the lack of combustion, it, it's perceived as less harmful and, and most likely it is less harmful in terms of pulmonary health, but we do need to be wary of these variances and, and what other risks there are that go with uh, oral cannabis products that, that are on the market at the moment. At the moment. Um, it, it's discreet. And, and again, what we're seeing is we're seeing marketing really kind of coming to play and, and driving this stuff. And, and when you see stuff like this, it, it invites the risk of accidental ingestion by kids and adults. Um, and so that's kind of the dark side of edibles is that you have variability in absorption. You, you're at risk of unintended ingestion. The inaccuracies accuracies that we've seen that lead to unpredictable effects. Um, the unpredictability also lends to the time course. Some people just 
um, have a really delayed onset of drug effects. And in some of our studies, we've seen people report no drug effect until three hours after they take the drug, and then they get a really robust and strong drug effect. And so what happens in some cases, people will take the drug, no effect after an hour, they take it again, and then three hours later, they get hammered. Um, so and because of that, edibles are the most common route of cannabis administration for ER visits and poison control calls associated with cannabis ingestion. The types of AEs with too high of a dose are numerous, but mostly we see uh, nausea and vomiting. Um, if someone's going to throw up in my lab studies, it almost always happens at the three hour time point. It's incredibly consistent. We see people get anxious and paranoid, a lot of dizziness. So with high doses of THC, you get orthostatic hypotension. So people going from sitting to standing, get dizzy and kind of have one person actually um, pass out on us. Um, tachycardia, sedation and cognitive impairment. Um, and we've done some online surveys that indicate that both users and providers are relatively poorly informed about edibles and don't communicate very well about what they're using, how, how they're using it, what doses and all of that kind of stuff. So from a clinical decision-making standpoint, if you are a clinician, talk to your patients. If you're not and you're a patient, you're interested, talk to your physician. Um, we need communication because again, those drug-drug interactions that I mentioned, uh, dosing, product selection, selection uh, risk versus benefit, all of that needs to be part of the patient uh, provider communication. Um, you know, matching the route of administration to the time course needed for therapeutic purposes is important, and it needs to be specific to the indication and the individual involved. Again, start low, find a, a dose that may or may not help, but back off if you see adverse events um, and, and follow it over time because we do see an attenuation of AEs with repeated use. The chemical composition is critical, as is regulation. It, it, well, again, cannabis products are very poorly regulated right now. So you want to start with pharmaceuticals if you can, in my mind, then go with state regulated market products and then kind of end everything else falls under that. Um, and it's important to carefully monitor safety and efficacy after it, uh, initiation and to adjust concomitant medications as needed. Um, the prime example of that was in the Epidiolex clinical trials. Um, people receiving Epidiolex had a 500% uh, increase in plasma clobazam levels for uh, people who were taking both medications. So moving forward, where do we need to go? What do we need to determine? What are we investigating now? Um, trying to identify target doses for the many therapeutic applications of these drugs. Um, we need to better understand abuse liability of all of these products. So historically, oral dosing has been less associated with problematic use behavior, but given all of these changes and new products on the market, I think we need to reevaluate that. Um, we need controlled research studies on all of these minor cannabinoids and novel products. We need to understand what nano emulsions do um, and understand the risks, the safety, the stability of, of these things. And, you know, one great example is there is a study that came out about a year or so ago saying that um, looking at the stability of cannabinoids and THC in a brownie, and it said, you know, this thing is good for it and stable for a month. So you can, a brownie's, you know, THC is stable and, and effective a month later. But if you look at Betty Crocker, it says you bake the brownie and use it and eat it within three days. So you can have eggs and other things in these things that spoil and go bad, and then you can be at risk there. So, um, just to kind of wrap things up, I think edibles are a diverse and very complex product category. It's really fascinating and interesting to research. Um, a lot of things 
are there's a lot of nuance to understanding that standing this and I think in talking about it we at the very minimum need to talk about CBD dominant versus THC dominant versus other things. Uh, we need to understand uh, formulations and, and safety and things like that and 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 really get a better grasp of, of how this works and how best to regulate these things to minimize harm and maximize benefit. Um, I can't move on without thinking the tons of people that have helped me with all of this stuff. Um, and I, we've got a little, little bit of time for questions that I'll try to answer. Um, but anything that we don't get to, my contact information is here. So um, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. That's a really outstanding uh, presentation. So detailed and so uh, organized and informative. So thanks a bunch. Um, yeah, as you notice, there are 10 questions uh, at this point in your uh, Q&A. So we have a little bit of flexibility depending on your schedule, Ryan, if, if we go over, but uh, let's get at them. So uh, starting at the top here, there's some people that say edibles don't, quote, don't work for them, that they can't feel effects from edible, edibles, but can from smoking or other forms of administration. What are your thoughts on those kinds of individual differences? Yeah, so I guess it, it really depends <clears throat> on, on what they tried and what they mean by work, <laughs> um, you know, did they take it on an empty stomach? Did they take a sufficient dose? Um, and there, there could be, you know, genetic polymorphisms that, that impact absorption. And, and some people may have just a really intense first pass metabolism here, but, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 there's nothing that I can come up with where I think that, you know, I, I can pinpoint any one thing. It could be a number of things and it could be a combination of things. Mm -hmm. Someone wants you to write a, uh, a textbook on cannabis. So I guess they were impressed with your presentation. <laughs> Look, from It looks like it, it could be um, out of date by the time you would get it written. So much happening. Anyhow, another person has a question about um, cannabis induced hyperemesis. I didn't even know about that before seeing this question, but I've looked it up and apparently there's a real thing and I'm sure you've heard about it. Um, and what they want to know uh, is there a validity to uh, consuming an edible at bedtime to prevent waking up in the morning with nausea and vomiting? So the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, from what I understand, is, is a slowly evolving disorder where people who frequently use cannabis will start to experience nausea and vomiting at, after using it. And there, there have been a, a couple ways of approaching elimination of that. Um, first is just stopping cannabis use. So if you eliminate the cannabis use, you eliminate the, the cyclic vomiting that comes with the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And that may take anywhere from a couple days to a couple months from what I've heard in, in various case reports. Um, there are two pharmacologic treatments that have been effective. Um, one is prazosin and the other is capsaicin. So non-cannabinoid pharmacologic interventions have been shown pretty reliably to attenuate the nausea and vomiting that come with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Excellent. Well, I have three questions here from Alan Budney. I'm going to see if I can collapse them. Each one has a different acronym. It's always so. greedy. <laughs> They're technical questions. Any lab data at all on CBG drug effects in humans? Um, and here's the second. Uh, given your CBD THC interaction lab study showing CBD enhances drug effects, what are your thoughts about the literature suggesting CBD can reduce the probability of psychotic like effects? Well, maybe I better hold off on a third, and let you try. <laughs> <laughs> the qu quick answer on CBG is there's no human lab studies done yet. Uh, we're in the process of contracting to do one. It's been a long drawn out process, but we're hoping to have CBG human data soon. We've got preclinical CBG data in Elise Wirtz's lab. So um, Stay tuned on CBG. Good man, um, I can see. I can see why this person <laughs> wants you to write a textbook. You're pretty informed about this. So, all right, on to the second one. Do you recall it, or should, you, should I read it again about? So uh, yeah, so the THC and CBD interactions is interesting, right? So the the common uh, 
thought in, in the industry and in the, in the lay public is that CBD attenuates THC effects. And there were a couple studies that showed that, but there have been an equal number that show that it has no effect or that it exacerbates the effects. And in my sense in looking across all of these things is that the dose is important. So the reason I think we're seeing this big interaction is we're using a big dose of CBD in this study. Um, we gave 640 milligrams of CBD with a fairly high dose, 20 milligrams of THC. Um, so we've got a grant going in that's going to use multiple doses and different ratios to try to tease that apart a little bit. But um, preclinical modeling uh, with some collaborators on the study that we're doing um, it seems to indicate that CBD in, indeed can interrupt THC metabolism through the um, CYP3A4 mechanism as well as a UGT mechanism. I can't remember okay. the number off the top of my head. One more crown, and I'm giving deference to Alan's questions because he's informed about the area. And I think, you know, is asking questions that are probably on other people's minds or could be add to the uh, information conveyed. So um, one more interaction question, THC opioid interaction studies. Um, the Peters study showed tolerance to adverse effects over time. What about tolerance to analgesia over time? Yeah, so, so Kelly Dunn is spearheading the cannabinoid opioid interaction stuff here at Hopkins. She's working with Claudia Campbell on that, and, and they've, they had two R01s, multiple studies under this, and it, it's, it's fascinating because we repeatedly ran into tolerability issues. Uh, where we had to reduce doses, people were getting sick and throwing up. And it, I don't know how much that's specific to oral dosing, the particular opioid that was used, or the fact that we were using dronabinol versus a, a whole plant botanical cannabis product. Um, when you look, people will argue that dronabinol is, is not as well tolerated as, as botanical cannabis products. Um, and there was some research out at, at uh, UCSF, I think Donald Abrams ran it, that the opioid in particular becomes important because CBD or THC can interrupt metabolism of, of those things. So we selected hydromorphone to avoid that, um, but it may be that codeine or morphine may be more tolerant or may have a better mechanism for, for synergy there. Um, Again, it, it's an area ripe for, for investigation. When you look at observational studies, most people report an opioid sparing effect of, of introducing cannabis as an analgesic, um, but most of those folks don't eliminate their opioids. So better understanding of how these two classes of drugs interact is, is really important and in an area where we need more controlled research, because there's a lot of anecdote, there's a lot of observational uncontrolled stuff. But as I showed, we don't really know what those people are actually taking in the uncontrolled studies. We, we can calculate morphine equivalents based on their opioid prescription and how many pills they're taking, but we can't easily or readily say, well, how much THC did that person get? Or what else did they get? Is it CBG, CBN, CBD, CBC, or whatever else? So that's the challenge in doing observational research um, and natural history studies with cannabinoids is it's really, really difficult to nail down dosing. Great. Okay. So um, we're about out of time, but I'm, if, if you're... Uh willing to put up with us, Ryan, try and get a couple additional questions answered. I'm good. Um, one in here on lipophilic nature of THC, is there an issue with buildup in the body over days, even with smaller doses of edibles? So you do get accumulation for certain. Um, and what ends up happening is it, a lot of it gets stored in fatty tissue. And you've got to remember your brain is also fatty, so it can get stored there and released and kind of have that gradual release. But when you look at pharmacokinetics, you see usually, especially with inhaled, you see a big bolus dose and then blood levels go down. It'll trickle on for a little bit, but it's usually the, 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 the cannabinoids that are released from tissue 
is not at sufficient concentration to cause a prolonged lingering drug effect. So usually the, the drug effect you have that you hit it with your dose with an edible, it'll go away four to six to eight hours, depending on how much you take. But the residual cannabinoids into the next day are usually not enough to cause continued impairment or intoxication. Great. Um, you mentioned wariness. Oh, let's see, this jumped around. You mentioned wariness um, about individuals with histories of psychosis. What about individuals with panic disorder, general anxiety disorder? Uh, any info on first time users experiencing panic or anxiety? So again, I think that's gonna depend on what product we're talking about and route of administration. So if we're talking about THC dominant products, um, there is there is a risk and, and it's dose dependent. Um, so when you look at the science on acute doses of, of THC, a tiny dose can be anxiolytic, a high dose can be anxiogenic. Um, and you can develop tolerance to, to the anxiogenic effects um, and probably tolerance to the anxiolytic effects as well. So it, it's really going to depend on, on where you are, but it's a, it's a biphasic type thing where uh, uh, the right dose can, can reduce anxiety. You push just a little bit past that and you can induce anxiety and panic. So you got to be really careful with that in our observational studies where we're seeing um, a lot of reduction in, in anxiety, depression, and, and things of that nature, it's usually with high CBD products and, and oral dosing and CBD oils and things of that nature. So um, I'd love to give more specifics on that, but we unfortunately we don't have it. Um, I'm not aware of any controlled clinical trials looking at people with this. So everything that we have right now is observational. And it's, like I said, it's challenging to know the product and the exact dose to give um, any, any more precise recommendations on that, but just to be careful with THC. Great. All right. So um, another one here asking about Delta 10 or Delta 8. Um, they are commonly marketed in states that do not have recreational uh, legalization. Yeah, so those are those are analogs of THC. They're available through a loophole in, in the farm bill that legalized hemp. So Delta 8, Delta 10 are in very, very tiny concentrations in hemp. And by what through the language in, in, in this bill, people can argue that these are legally naturally extracted from hemp plants and therefore legal products. Um, Delta 8 and Delta 10, again, a couple very small studies conducted 50 years ago suggest that they are Delta 9 THC like, um, but not quite as potent. Um, but again, the, it depends on which endpoint you look at. So if you looked at the researchers' observations of Delta 8 THC versus Delta 9 THC, they said, eh, it was about 40% less potent. But if you look at the cardiovascular outcomes, it was about equally as potent. Um, so again, we're, we're, we've got a Delta-8 lab study that's going to be starting hopefully within the next two months. Um, we're going through regulatory approvals right now um, that'll hopefully shed some light on that. I imagine Delta-6 and Delta-10 will be coming in the next year or two out of our lab. All right. Um... Maybe, maybe I'll make this the last one. This could go on forever and I want to respect your time. Um, so the, um, do you think the dose labels should account for the solvent used and the resulting bioavailability? And if you went in that direction, how would you convey the information to the consumer? Uh, I, I think the solvent used is less important on the label and less, if, as long as you've got good, regulations on that there's no solvents left in the product. Um, I, I've not seen anything that suggests that how cannabinoids or other constituents are extracted from the plant impacts the end result. What we need is we need a process by which the manufacturing has tight regulations to ensure that there's no residual solvents or other byproducts of the extraction process. 
and that the contents of the final product are fully characterized with respect to the cannabinoids, you know, the decarboxylation of the acids of THC, CBD, CBG, and the other ones, and the full list of, of all the cannabinoids that, that we know are important are in there. Best that we can do that, the more information we have and, and the assurance that it's accurate, the better. Part of our issue with all of that right now is that there's very poor oversight and there's, there's a lack of established um, analytical methodology and consistency in analytical methods to ensure that the certificate of analysis you get from one laboratory is going to be the same as the other, same as the other, as well as the quality control. So what's sampled and tested by the laboratory, how representative is that of the product that's available for retail purchase on the shelf? Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for such an informed uh, presentation on such a timely topic. And, it, you know, what you just ended it with is, is really a little scary in, this, in the way when you think about how all this is exploding in, in the marketplace. So uh, keep doing the great work and, and thanks for taking the time to share it with us. It's my pleasure, Steve. Thanks again for having me. All right. Bye bye. Thanks to everyone in the audience as well. So we're, we're uh, off until next month. Thank you very much.